All right, everyone, welcome to our latest edition of Eli on Air, the Eli Talks weekly interactive broadcast where we talk with interesting folks from across the Jewish spectrum about ideas of Jewish engagement, literacy, and identity. My name is Miriam Brousseau, and I am the program director of Eli Talks, and I'm really thrilled today to be speaking with young adult author Phoebe North, who wrote an awesome book called Starglass. And um, it deals in a really interesting way with issues of Jewish identity and cultural preservation and the Jewish future in general. So I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. And um, for those of you out there watching us live, you're welcome to submit your questions and ideas right here through the YouTube video. And um, so we'll be happy to take those live on the air throughout our conversation. Um, we'll also keep an eye on the Twitter stream. You can submit hashtag Eli Talks with your questions and ideas, and we'll be happy to respond to those here. Um, and so with that, um, we'll just kick it off with Phoebe. Um, so Phoebe, can you tell us just a little bit about who you are and about this this novel, Starglass, that you wrote? And um, and we'll, we'll give a little overview of the book itself for folks who haven't, maybe necessarily haven't read it. Um, but also, we, we, won't, we won't give any plot spoilers away. Uh, sounds um, good. There are some big spoilers. So uh, exactly. I have a visual aid of the book, even though it's also right down there. Um, but so I'm Phoebe North, and this is Starglass, my first novel, which came out last July in hardcover and is coming out in about a week in paperback. Um, along with the sequel, um, I live in upstate New York with my husband and my husband and my really cute baby who I tweet way too many pictures of. And uh, yeah, so Star Glass, my husband, brilliant husband, came up with a pitch uh, for it as my so called life meets Jews in space. So it's the story of Tara, a 16 year old girl uh, who lives on a generation ship that left the Earth just before it was about to be destroyed 500 years ago. And they're just about to land on the planet. Um, and she has angst about various things in her life. She gets sucked into a rebellion. Um, but the reason why Starglass is very relevant to the, to the talk today is because the ship um, was sent by a Jewish cultural preservation society. and their intention was to preserve Jewish traditions and culture uh, after the earth was destroyed. So there's kind of like little bits of Judaism sprinkled throughout and you kind of learn more about that through the first book and that kind of deepens and gets more complicated in the book. Mm. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so first, Phoebe, I'm just going to ask you to lean forward just a tad so oh, we can sure. get a little better audio from you. Um, so tell me about this uh, about this Jewish Cultural Preservation Society. Who are they? What do they care about? And um, how is that reflected in what happens on the ship? So the way I had imagined it um, is, is that there are these different groups on the Earth right before the Earth is hit by an asteroid who are sort of scrambling to figure out how we're going to survive after this apocalypse and, and what we're going to keep. Um, and I imagine them as sort of the New York Jews that I grew up among in the tri-state area who uh, are not necessarily, don't necessarily have the deepest religious convictions, but are sort of all about their American diaspora and experience in Judaism and preserving those traditions. Um, and so they're the majority stakeholders in this spaceship, although they're not the only factor there. This culture becomes a little muddled and complicated over the 500 years because there's different influences, just like in our own society. Um, a lot of it for me was sort of just a way to mirror my own background growing up in sort of a mishmash of religious influences. Um, I, my father was a Gentile, my mother was raised very Jewish. Uh, she was briefly disowned for marrying my father, which is pretty intense. Um, and so I grew up with Jewish religious traditions and Christian religious traditions, but I've always felt very sort of close to the Jewish cultural stuff. Uh, but I didn't always understand it as a kid. I didn't go to Hebrew school. We didn't belong to a synagogue. And so I grew up hearing terms like mensch, and I thought this meant a good guy. And it kind of does, you know, but it has this deeper meaning behind it. And I wanted to sort of have this cultural flavor that I was familiar with. And so that's where the Jewish Preservation Society came. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Um, and so you mentioned the term mensch, and there are a bunch of other <laughs> Jewish and Yiddish and Hebrew sort of general mm -hmm. terms that get um, that get uh, tossed around and kind of reinvented throughout the story. So um, can you say a little bit about your your choices of those words and specifically? Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the uh, the name of the ship, the Asherah, mm -hmm. and the name of the planets that they're headed towards, um, which is Zahava, and then um, and then also the word Mitzvah. So um, I originally didn't plan Starglass to be a Jewish book at all. It had all of these like really generic world building terms and like just like speak futuristic slang. And I have some really good beta readers who read an early version and were like, what is this? This is, you know, this is no good. Um, and I think the ship was originally called the Maya, and the planet had some other name with gold in it, because it's a Goldilocks planet. It's supposed to be just right for the conditions. Um, and I was, so I was sort of thinking about this question of how to make the, the culture deeper and more deeply felt and authentic. And I just realized that sort of through my own um, through my own speech and writing, these sort of Yiddishisms were coming out in the book. I had already named Tara Tara Feinberg, but I thought that was just a placeholder. That's my mother's maiden name. Um, and I thought I would make it something more generically YA. I have no idea what that would be, but Tara Smith or something. I don't know. Um, but they, the characters sort of started to just speak in Yiddish and sort of sprinkle it around. And that's sort of, that's where I got, I was like, okay, well, this spaceship shouldn't be the Maya then. That doesn't make sense. And the planet shouldn't be, I really can't remember what I think it's something Greek for gold. Um, it would be Zahava, which is gold, uh, and Asherah from the Jewish traditions instead of these, these other Greek traditions. Um, and a lot of the terms, a lot of the other terms sort of came out of that sort of thing, just kind of figuring out that this needed to be a Jewish book and sort of speak more to my cultural experience. Hmm. The, the term Zahava for the planet, I'm so surprised to hear that this Goldilocks connection, but I love it. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I read it and saw that the planet was called Zahava, I thought about you know the early Jewish immigrants to America, referring to referring to the United States as the Golden of Medina, right? As the mm -hmm. as the as the Golden Land, and it seemed to sort of reflect that aspect of Jewish history. Was that intentional, or am I reading it, too much? It wasn't, but I love that. I you know I, w <laughs> I wish that was built into it. Um, I think there is sort of this. You know, it's sort of, it's almost tongue-in-cheek, almost belittling to call this planet you're traveling 500 years to a Goldilocks planet. It's like a little cutesy. But I do think there's something about, like, the golden land and the promised land, and, mm -hmm. and that, that connotation is definitely there, I think, for the inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little bit about, um, I, a little bit about the word mitzvah, meaning, mm -hmm. meaning commandments or good deed, depending mm -hmm. on sort of the tradition that you come from, and how that gets reinvented on the ship? So on the ship, one of the challenges about building a generation spaceship society is that um, you really have to get the people to be obedient and to sort of mm -hmm. have this social contract so that the society can continue for 500 years because the people are trapped on it. You can't have chaos. Um, and so the way the people on the spaceship have sort of connived it is they've taken these Jewish traditions that they've started with and they've made them cultural obligations and um, sort of elevated values. And so, you know, I start with the term mitzvah, which means commandment, but also can be referred to as a good deed, that sort of thing. And they've sort of built that value into these um, various sort of participatory traditions that they can do. You know, it's a mitzvah to go see a baby be born or to, you know, uh, do a good job in your vocation, that sort of thing. And it's really, it's sort of all about the social contracts that keep us as a society moving and mm -hmm. how we how we sort of justify those to ourselves. And so Tara's father, who is a good citizen, is talking all the time about mitzvahs and, you know, fulfilling these sort of social contracts. Hmm. Um, so how, so I guess the, you know, one of the things that really separates this 
community from, say, just the American Jewish community mm -hmm. is that they are trapped in this bubble together for generations and generations. So, um, for I mean, among our among the Eli Talks audience, there's lots of folks who are interested in in cultural preservation in general. But mm -hmm. you know, we're not living in that bubble. So, can you say mm -hmm. a little bit about the difference between sort of the choices that you might make as to what you preserve to keep mm -hmm. Judaism going in a system that's entirely closed um, versus kind of what that looks like in the open air? That's a really good question. Um, think about it. I think I think the major difference um, is really is a matter of choice, and these citizens have no choice. Um, and and so you have these sort of bits of cultural tradition that have become intentionally twisted, and that's been a, a means of social control. Mm -hmm. But in in our own society, sometimes cultural cultural traditions become twisted anyway, and there's sort of you know um, people from New York speak Yiddish who are Italian, and they don't know what those words mean really, but they still speak it, and it becomes part of the tradition too. Um, but I think choice makes a, a major, major difference in it. Um, I do think that the question of sort of divorcing the cultural traditions from the religious traditions is an interesting one. Uh, I don't really know the solutions to that. I kind of explore the, that theme in both books through the character of Rachel, who's Tara's best mm -hmm. friend, and starts to re-explore her Judaism. Um, but yeah, I don't really know how to resolve the question mm. of their Jewish culture is separate from the Jewish religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's a big question for all of us, I think. <laughs> and, yeah. And I, I love that, you know, that you're playing with that in, in such mm -hmm. a fun and creative way. And, um, I, and I love that you brought up Rachel, too, because I think there's, um, as, as you mentioned, for for those who haven't read the book, I mean, Rachel does kind of start getting into Judaism mm -hmm. towards the end of towards the end of the book, and it's um, and it's such an interesting turn. Um, how do you feel? I mean, the the book is set at a point where there's already been generations of people living on this Jewish funded ship, mm -hmm. and um, so at this point, when they've been in space for so long, when they've been you know living out this mission. Um, how are these characters feeling about Judaism? What would you say is their is their Jewish identity, if any, especially given that they are closed off from any other possible tradition? I'd say for the most part, their awareness of Jewish identity is very, very low, which I think kind of complicates it. They see themselves as Asher and as people who are part of this spaceship and part of this mission, but not necessarily as Jews, even though that was part of the mm -hmm. explicit um, mission. But it does sort of, in the second book, there's not only Rachel who sort of continues to explore her Judaism, but there are other characters who have sort of these deeper religious convictions. And that was really important to me because I think any time, you know, as a kid even, I would be not only with Judaism, but I'd wonder why our days of the week are named after, you know, uh, gods, you know, why is it Thor's day? And I would sort of research into that and explore it more. And I think any time you have these sort of remnants of cultural tradition, there will be curious people who will look more deeply into it. So, yeah, but I don't think most of the people on the ship don't identify as Jews, and they might not know what a Jew is if asked. Um, but I've sort of been thinking a lot about whether whether I consider, say, Tara the main character Jewish. And in a way, she very much is, but in another way, not by a lot of definitions of who is a Jew, which is a complicated question anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so it seems like, I mean, in a lot of, um, in religious Jewish circles, you might say that there are these sort of three pillars of Judaism, right? That there's the people Israel, mm -hmm. there is, um, there's the Torah, um, the Bible, and then mm -hmm. there's God. And it seems like what happens on this ship is that all you have is the people, mm -hmm. and there's not, there doesn't seem to be really any infusion of either Torah or God. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think your sense that they've sort of just excised this one part of Jewish identity from these other parts um, 
is for the most part true, but at the same time, um, I don't think you can ever really purely excise that for everyone. I think as long as there are those cultural traditions alive, there will be people who sort of start questioning, uh, asking religious questions, that sort of thing, studying the Torah. Um, and I also think in order to in order to sort of bring down this social control, the people who designed this ship replaced God with being a good mm -hmm. citizen with these almost like Marxist values. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not they're wholly successful, you know, they've gotten through 500 years and they haven't had, the, the ship hasn't blown up, so the success in that way, but whether or not you can sort of continue doing that indefinitely for everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm probably not. <laughs> Do you think that the way the story, um, or the, the way that people behave and their, their connection to Judaism and Jewish culture is what the Jewish Cultural Preservation Society at the beginning of the book that launches the ship off. Do you think mm -hmm. that they're living out what they intended or that this society would be surprised and appalled or surprised and delighted at... Um, uh, I'm it probably involved? closer to appalled. Um, because obviously there have been changes and sort of Terra discovers how the missions become distorted over time. Um, but at the same time, you know, I feel like any mission that takes 500 years to play out, the likely sort of gets away from its creator a little bit. And maybe that, that parallels the creative process or any book you set down to write it and I thought I was going to write a generic space opera and ended up exploring my Judaism, you know. Mm -hmm. so I think, I think sort of plans have a way of going awry over time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's the um, what's the reaction been to the book from Jews and non-Jews alike? Um, very good. You know, I'm always very happy when I hear about the book connecting with readers, especially teenagers. That's always exciting. Um, a lot of teenage readers seem a little flummoxed by the, the Jewishisms. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten a couple reviews that are like, you know, nothing against Jews, but there's a lot of Jewish stuff in this book. They kind of don't quite know what to make of it. Um, but I'm glad to sort of have that expose them to these cultural traditions, especially since we're so immersed in sort of Christian traditions and a lot of YA. I think it's good to, have, to di diversify that generally. Um, and I've really just been sort of tickled with how it's connected with other Jewish readers. I have a, a I got a review from a rabbi a couple months ago, and it was great and it was just you know it's just really fun sort of to connect with other people who come from different uh, sort of corners of Judaism and traditions and sort of just dialogue about what it means to be Jewish, what a Jewish future could look like, you know, what Jewish identity is, because I'm, I'm just a geek about that. So it's just fun to sit here and talk about that. <laughs> is this, is it kind of do you feel like you kind of wrote the book that you'd wish that you wish you'd been able to read when you were Tara's age, or when you in a, in a lot of ways? And I think um, it's not not just the Judaism, but talking about grief because it's very much a novel about grief. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I think about sort of the lack of the lack of Jewish cultural elements in books. And when I was a kid, how there was really the all the kind family, which I love, and books about the Holocaust, and that mm. was sort of, it. you know, there's occasionally books that just have contemporary books with, with Jewish characters, um, but never really a science fiction novel that I encountered, at least, if you have suggestions to them to me, I'll, I'll to, to read them. Um, yeah, and so I think I think it's really I'm glad it's connected with other readers too. They're sort of like, oh, I love that there's Yiddish in the future, and that makes me feel right at home. And that's really yeah, I imagine the folks at at Yivo and those and you know the Yiddish institutes are 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 pretty thrilled to see your vision. Um, <laughs> and um, so so can you tell me a little bit about um, about the process, a little bit more about the process of writing the book and mm -hmm. um, how that how that sort of impacted you? If it was there was there a way that it, it sort of infusing this what was intended to be I don't mean to say more generic but yeah, more, yeah, it was yeah a, a more traditional kind of um, kind of story infusing it with that Jewish element. What did that what did that mean for you as a as a as a Jewish woman and what did that mean for you as a writer? It's you know it's funny because 
there was a long time when sort of after college I felt a little um, uncomfortable with my Judaism or uncomfortable claiming my Judaism I say I would say I was like Jewish more than Jewish you know uh, mm -hmm. a dash in between and and it's sort of it's always a process but I feel like coming out and writing a book that is more explicitly Jewish and explores these things kind of has helped me sort of take ownership of my Jewish identity and the traditions I come from, which has been, it feels really great, you know, to feel more comfortable with that. Um, there was a period of time right before it came out when I was like really, really afraid to talk about it because I have such a goyish name and I have tattoos and, you know, are people going to think I'm Jewish enough to talk about these things? And, you know, it was kind of, who knows? Like, I haven't gotten many negative reactions, maybe a little, a couple of reviews that are head scratching a little bit. Who is this mm -hmm. probably Christian person who's using Giddish or whatever? Um, but I think that sort of, even that just speaks to how complicated Jewish identity is in America and how hard it is. You know, and I, I felt a lot of, I went on a birthright trip uh, during graduate school and I felt a lot of those mm -hmm. feelings then too before boarding a plane. To Israel, you know, am I Jewish enough to do this to explore my mm -hmm. heritage? And and I'm happy to sort of reach a place of more peace about it, where I can talk about these themes and feelings, and maybe they'll help other young Jews take ownership. Mm -hmm. Is there is there something? So I I've come across some children's literature recently mm -hmm. that deals with issues of gender identity, and mm -hmm. it often sets these um, these very complicated issues. In another world, or in another mm -hmm. time, or um, you know, just at, out out in space and things like that. Is there is there something about um, about setting these questions in in the context of science fiction um, mm -hmm. that makes it safer or easier to talk about? You know, I think in a lot of ways it does. And sci-fi is sort of the literature of metaphors, uh, mm -hmm. which is something I love about it. Um, you don't have to, I don't have to write this book that's about my journey of getting on a plane and going on my birthright trip explicitly to talk about my, my feelings about that experience and about sort of my, my influence. And it is, it feels safer as a writer uh, sometimes to talk in metaphor. I was, before I wrote YA, I have, I have my graduate degree in poetry and I was writing purely autobiographical poetry, but it was really hard sometimes to sort of constantly pour open a vein and expose yourself like that and expose your whole biography. And so it's, mm -hmm. this way you have sort of this added cushion, um, but also you get to talk about fun things like aliens and spaceships, and I always love that too, so why not? <laughs> you can't go wrong with aliens and spaceships. And, That's, um, yeah. I love it, I love it. So um, we have a question from Alan who is asking, um, it seems like there are a lot of Jewish fans of the sci-fi genre. Um, is there something about sci-fi that speaks particularly to the Jewish soul, or perhaps the Jewish sensibility? Um, if so, what? So, would you say that there's something Jewish about sci-fi? Um, you know, I I would say that there probably is, if only because um, in many ways, for thousands of years, we've been a culture in diaspora. Uh, we've been the stranger in a strange land, so to speak, and mm -hmm. You know, and I think a lot of sci-fi is dealing with those themes of alienation and otherness too, uh, which I think is something we all feel at times as Jews. Uh, and so I think sci-fi is a really interesting way to explore that. I also just think there's, uh, you know, Spock is Jewish in a lot of ways. You know, I think um, I think there's just a sort of tradition of that, and I'm not quite sure why it always appeals it seems to so many. And many Jewish readers, but I think it does. And it could it could just be the otherness of mm -hmm. feeling alien. You know. Right. And and turning that into into speaking in metaphor, as you mentioned before. Right. I think yeah. that's there's there's something there. Um, mm -hmm. so um so can you tell me a little you you've got a you you've got Starglass is the is the first of a duology. You wanna say anything about yeah, about the next I love the cover so much. Uh, <laughs> so Starbreak is the sequel, and it picks up right where Starglass left off. I will warn everyone who hasn't read Starglass that it ends in a really mean cliffhanger. 
Um, but Star Break is out next week too, so you just pick up the sequel and in two weeks. Next week. Oh. It's July eighth. July eighth. I think. <laughs> but it's soon, so you can just pick up the sequel and you know find out what happens to Tara seconds after the first book ends. Um, mm -hmm. And Starbreak, so I always conceived of it as a duology. The first book set on the ship, the second book set at the ship's destination. And I've just been really happy to see, um, sort of through a very long editing process, see that come to light. And Starbreak's really like the book that I've always wanted to write since I was a 13-year-old little girl. It's, uh, it's set on the alien planet. It's about Terra kind of taking control of her life and going exploring and maybe falling in love with an alien boy. Uh, and it deals sort of more deeply with questions about um, Zionism. Can you have Judaism in the future without Israel? What does that look like? Um, and yeah, and I just had a great time writing it. So I hope people enjoy it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, we have a question that came in from Twitter. Sure. Um, so how does exploring Jewish identity through a teen character differ mm -hmm. from characters of other ages? You know, one of the things I sort of struggled with in reading YA as uh, a reader sort of beyond YA age around the time I, I read Star Glass was that in science fiction, at least, religion was rarely, rarely talked about. Um, it just sort of it wasn't there. It's not in the background. You might have novels written by uh, writers from different religious traditions, but they never sort of, the characters never dialogue about it. Um, but I think, in a way, discussions of religion are perfect for YA because mm -hmm. I sort of feel like as an adult, it's become, like, if you bring up questions about the universe and God at a party, people are like, oh, this person's pretentious. You know, we all talked about that in college. We're over those, those things. But mm -hmm. as a teenager, I was discussing God and the nature of the universe with my friends all the time, and it, it seemed really normal to have these big conversations. Um, and so that's something I sort of wanted to bring uh, to Starglass and to the table as a writer of YA. This, this sense of, of religiosity and questioning and philosophy that teenagers have and this openness about it. And mm -hmm. so you get that a little bit in Starglass when Tara talks to Rachel about her religious feelings, and you get a lot more of that in Starbreak, where there are some more explicit conversations where the characters sort of sit down and say, you know, what do you think about all this God stuff? I don't know, what do you think? And, and, and I think that's a very adolescent thing, but not not a mm -hmm. trifling thing. I think that's it's wonderful that teenagers can ask these big questions openly. I love it. I love that the combination of the sort of teenage curiosity and openness and exploratory kind of building your identity stage of your life combined yeah. with this this sort of safe haven of sci-fi where you can do anything um, yeah. <laughs> really lets you kind of play with all kinds of ideas. Um, yes. it, I you know I had a blast writing these and I love writing for and about teenagers. They're just they're a ton mm -hmm. of fun. So. <laughs> So you, so to wrap up our conversation today, um, you also have an adorable daughter who I believe is about five months old right five now. Five months today, um, yeah. Five months today. Yeah. Happy birthday month. Um, <laughs> so um, I would, I would love to know to close out our conversation. What kind of Jewish future do you imagine for for your daughter? Um, you know, it's a it's a really hard question. I know I definitely want to raise her with the traditions I was raised with, which are very important to me. Um, at the same time, I sort of put myself sort of on the far humanist Jewish side of the spectrum where I'm very questioning about the God stuff still. I go back and forth about how I feel about that. Um, so it's hard. My husband's an atheist, so I don't know how we'll resolve these questions. I'm shul shopping. I'm telling you there's two reconstructionist synagogues around here. And, you know, it's kind of about finding the right community and the right fit, I think, for her. But mm -hmm. I'm happy to expose her to that and to kind of help her grapple with the big questions about the universe. It's, it's really exciting. Amazing. I love it. And I'm sure by the time she's a teenager, she'll be asking all of these kinds of questions. And you'll be more than equipped to help guide her through that. So, um, <laughs> Let's go. <hope. laughs> um, 
so that wraps up our time for today. I want to thank um, thank you so much, Phoebe, for um, spending your time and sharing your talent with us in the world. I understand you're going to be in Michigan at some point in the yeah. near future. July 16th, I'm doing an event with Veronica Roth in Lansing, and I'm super excited about it. We should, uh, we should talk to lots of teenagers, and it should be a blast. So hopefully, if anyone's in the Michigan area, come out and see me in Michigan. Very cool. So we've got Michigan coming up. We've got Starbreak coming out, which I'm pre-ordering for, and I think it's going to be great. And um, so thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening in, for watching, for sharing your questions. Um, we do Eli on air every week except for next week when we're taking off. Um, but the following week, which I believe is July 10th, We'll be talking with a uh, with David Chack and a couple other really smart people about the 50th anniversary of Fiddler on the Roof and what that means and all kinds of fun stuff about um, Jewish theater and Yiddish literature and great stuff. So I hope that you will tune in. Um, so thank you again. We'll see you next time and um, keep the conversation going online. Thanks again, Phoebe. Thanks.